Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Can you hear me? Splendid, splendid. Uh, this presentation will be uh, slightly more technical than what you've become accustomed to. I hope that's to everybody's pleasing. Uh, I had the uh, fortunate luck some 10 years ago to get an engineering position at Google. And I was part of the team that built what is now called Hangouts. Uh, and that gave me sort of a glimpse into the future, because Google were at the time the only company doing what we today call big data. And uh, I sort of realized that this is their, their ability to manage data and extract value from it was uh, a big component in their success. Um, so um, as a result, I have spent my career afterwards gravitating towards using data and extracting value from it. And I've done that at scale at uh, Spotify and at Chipstead Media Group. And uh, nowadays, I'm an independent consultant helping other companies uh, getting value from data. I mostly help on the engineering side, but also on, on like technical strategy. And today's talk is going to be about stream processing. Uh, we see as more and more companies sort of adopt the, the uh, extract value from data mentality, we see that they collect more data and they build more applications out of data. Um, usually, the bulk of these applications are technically implemented as batch processes, where you, like, on a daily basis, process all of the data that you have over the last 24 hours of data. In some cases, however, uh, we need faster processing. There are limitations to the batch processing. <clears throat> the delay between new incoming data and your ability to react on that data is counted in one or more hours. And in some cases, we want a faster reaction time. One typical case would be uh, fraud detection, where if you have a fraudulent customer, you want to react quickly and not let him go about with his fraudulent behavior for an hour or two. So. Uh, what I will describe to you is, is an overview of how to build uh, data streaming processes. Uh, I will focus on the data processing side and sort of extracting value from data, but the architectures here is also applicable for building uh, microservices in an asynchronous and decoupled manner. Now, uh, data systems that sort of react in real time to new data is nothing new. They've been uh, present forever. Uh, there hasn't, however, been any sort of emerging uh, strong sustainable architectural patterns that have been success, uh, uh, fundamentally successful. In the past, the, the sort of real-time data systems were all often uh, architectured and welded together in an ad hoc manner with different kind of interconnections with, with queues and polling and pushing and, and uh, REST interfaces and so forth. Very often, they are synchronous. Even if, if you have queues, the, um, they tend to be consumed in a synchronous manner. And this synchros synchronous... Oh, that was too difficult a word. The synchronous manner of building things meant that if one link fails, the whole chain tends to fail. And that's why they are limited in complexity, and it's also hard to recover from things going wrong. The pattern that has emerged, which I believe originates from LinkedIn, is called the unified log. And that's the, a, an architectural pattern and a mentality where you publish everything that might be interesting for some other service or feature in a common shared log. And this log is technically replicated and sharded so that it's scalable and uh, reliable. Unlike previous similar implementations, like enterprise service buses, for example, this one is, is simple and keeps very little state so that consumers do not affect each other and, and are not able to, to, to sort of affect the reliability of other services. And it also has history, often very long history, counted in weeks or months. And this history is something that makes it reliable, which we will see later. You typically tap this log to, to uh, your data lake in order to uh, get all of the data and uh, make batch processes from there. And that data lake is foundation, the foundation of your batch processing. Now, the 
the unified log contains raw events, raw unfiltered, which are not uh, in themselves useful. They need to be refined. So you build pipelines of stream processing jobs that take one topic, one, one sort of channel from this unified log, uh, process the data, perhaps by combine, combining with other topics or other or databases, and emit refined data to new topics. And each, uh, for each job that takes a, street, uh, a topic in and a topic out, they publish to the same unified log again. So we have a technically homogeneous environment. And since this log and all of the streams, all of the topics in there have history, the, it means that these jobs, these stream processing uh, components are decoupled. If one goes down, uh, we can survive that because it can, we can bring it up later and we can reprocess the data that we have missed and it will catch up. So this enables us to scale to much more complex uh, scenarios and also scale in terms of organizations. So you can have different teams handling these processes. Now, you will also have databases in your environment. The applications need that. They need some way to look up the current state of data. And if you bring on in the stream processing architecture, you have to choose for each data set or each uh, domain data where lies the source of truth. And you basically have three options. One is to write both to your database and to your stream. Then you have essentially have two sources of truth, which will eventually uh, diverge. Uh, and that can be acceptable in some cases, but you need to be aware of this risk. This is the most simple solution. There's another technology called change data capture that's useful for these cases. That basically takes the, the commit log stream from a, from a uh, database, for example, a SQL database, and emits it into the stream. So you have a, a sort of a trusted component uh, keeping these two in sync. And then you can read off that stream and do whatever you want. Then there's an architecture pattern which says that the stream is the source of truth. And your database is actually sort of a cached view of a certain position in the stream. And the, the contents of the database will be the sum of all events that have happened since the beginning of time. Uh, and in this case, you write uh, to the stream and then you will have to wait. If you want a, a fresh result, you will have to wait for from the database. I see that this has fallen off the screen. This, this pattern is called command query uh, representation segregation. Correct me if I'm wrong, Torsten. Res command query responsibility segregation. Separation. Thank you. So in, in the path from raw events, to uh, a final result, you typically have the, the building blocks that you have are typically the same as you have in your in batch processing or, or in, in uh, uh, ETL processing with relational databases. You aggregate things, you stri you filter, you join with other data sets, and so forth. Uh, there is very little difference here, except that the data set, the data sets that you're working with are like open-ended, so there's some difference in semantics. Uh, joining can be a bit challenging because there's, what does it mean to join two streams? We know what it means to join two tables. Uh, typically, when you join two streams, you work with windows of time instead. Uh, you might want to ask why that would make sense at all, but there are a couple of scenarios. For example, when calculating uh, click-through rate, you might have one stream with ads that you've shown and one stream with clicks, and you want to figure out how many, how many peop users within a time window clicked on your... Uh, on your ads. Uh, there are a, nowadays a fairly large number of stream processing technologies out there uh, that have emerged in the last few years. I'm not going to go through them. I'll just mention two that I find uh, inter more interesting than others for different reasons. One is Spark Streaming, and the, uh, the charming part of Spark Streaming is that very much of the code is shared with Spark in batch processing mode, so that, that provides a good platform if you have a heavy batch processing. You can, sh you can share most of the code and avoid duplication. 
It used to be the case that Spark Streaming had fairly weak semantics and that could create uh, trouble sometimes, uh, but they have now improved quite a lot. Uh, the other one that I want to mention is called uh, Kafka Streams. And uh, you might have seen in one of the earlier slides that I mentioned Apache, Apache Kafka. That's the most popular technology today to implement such a, a unified log. And Kafka Streams this is it, the attached uh, stream processing library. And the charming uh, property of Kafka Streams is like, un unlike the other streaming processing technologies, it is not a framework. You don't need to maintain an operating cluster and so forth. Kafka Streams is just a library, which means that you can use your standard uh, deployment uh, strategies and just link it in. So eventually, when you have refined your, your data, when you have built your, for example, your machine learning models or your fraud detection models and so forth, uh, in order to get value from the data, you need to push it out of this stream processing system. You very rarely use such processing systems uh, and connect them to live services. You se typically separate the offline world from the online world. Uh, if you want uh, to build stream processing for analytics purposes, you just you know, update a database or whatever, uh, and have a, a, like an analytics dashboard read from the database. If you are serving user content, for example, you're updating uh, like uh, recommendation indexes, then it's a good pattern to, uh, to uh, at a period, emit a new model, a machine learning model, a new recommendation index, and keep the history of the old ones still there, uh, so that if something goes wrong, you can switch back to an older index. You might also want to push your data to clients to, uh, and uh, to, in order to implement push notifications, for example. Now, this is a bit tricky because uh, when you go from client, the, the clients typically have very little resources. They are often mobile phones. Towards the data center, you, the, the data goes in a path towards increasing resources. You have lots of resources in your data center. So, uh, and the technology that enables you to suck things in is typically just want to uh, move the data from the client towards the data center as fast as possible. If you try to move data in the reverse direction as fast as possible, you will flood your clients, or you will risk flooding your clients. And if you f uh, even if the client refuses to receive data, you might flood some intermediate buffer in between. Uh, and that will uh, make your solution fragile. In order to remedy this, the, um, there is a new technology called reactive streams, where ACA streams is the most popular implementation. And that implements a, uh, a sort of a chain of back pressure so that the receivers, if they cannot receive data, can uh, signal up to generating sources in the data center that you now need to back off and, uh, and not send me any more data until I allow you to. This is all great, um, and this is actually fairly easy to set up, and, and you can do very impressive demos in, in short time. Uh, when you actually push things out to production, they become, uh, things become more complicated, however. Machines fail, and, but more frequently, humans fail and make mistakes. Uh, you also frequently have issues with events getting out of order or delayed and so forth. And, um, it's for these reasons that you usually revert to batch processing if you can, because the tooling and the patterns for handling these issues in batch processing are much better and more mature than for stream processing. There are a number of patterns that have emerged uh, for handling these situations, and I will briefly go through a few of the popular ones. One is called the Lambda architecture pattern. And uh, in this pattern, you basically say that <coughs> stream processing is great, but we don't rely on it. We, don't, we accept that it might uh, generate incorrect results. And if we care about having correct results, we will have a batch process on the side that does the same uh, computation, but that's what we rely on. And when serving data, we query the batch system if, if it has already has some data, but if it hasn't yet finished with the computation, we take the results of the stream processing. And uh, the drawback with the Lambda architecture is that you need to implement the same pipeline twice, and, that, uh, and that's a over maintenance overhead. 
So uh, the fellows at LinkedIn say this doesn't make sense, that's too much overhead, and uh, coin the, the Kappa architecture, which uh, where it addresses um, at least human faults by saying that if we push out incorrect stream processing code and now find a bug and want to correct it, in the unified log we have all of the history, so we just you know back off, do a recomputation and everything, and emit a new result. Uh, and that works fine as long as there's a single job in your pipeline. That doesn't really scale to longer pipelines with multiple jobs, because if something goes wrong upstream, then there's a lot of work figuring out what to recalculate downstream, and there are no tools to help you here. Uh, then there's a pattern which uh, I don't think it has a name. I coined it the Delta pattern, uh, which is described by Netflix, uh, where they have layers of sort of freshness. So they have a batch processing system for, uh, that takes a lot of data in, uh, in and uh, do the sort of most correct calculations. This is what they use for, uh, for their uh, recommendation engines. Uh, and then they have a stream processing system which uh, sort of adds a delta based on the things that have recently happened. So the batch processing calculates sort of your taste, whereas the stream processing calculates uh, additions to your taste that might be affected, for example, by your, uh, the people that are known to have a similar taste as yours, what they have been uh, watching recently. And then they have an online layer as well. These are called offline, nearline, and online layer. In the online layer, they take into account what has happened in the few, last few seconds so that they, for example, don't show the same recommendations over and over within the same session. Google has coined the data flow architecture, uh, which handles that data is coming late. And they, they have an uh, implementation where uh, they react to incoming late data by sort of sending updates and so that the system can say, OK, I made this computation before, and here was the result, but I, I've changed my mind. Here's the new result. So that uh, caters for a different type of, of uh, uh, real life problem. Um, one other thing that you need to have a plan and, and keep in mind is handling schemas. Uh, some people uh, call things schemaless, but there is no such thing as uh, schemaless. You always have a schema. You either have it an explicit schema, which is the norm in the uh, relational database world, uh, or you have an implicit schema, which is assumptions in your code on what fields uh, will be present when you read your data sets. Uh, there's no best answer here. Usually in streaming systems, you, you tend to gravitate towards uh, schema on read uh, because it allows you to be more agile with adding new fields and so forth uh, without redeploying all of your systems. But this is something that you need to plan for. That's, that's sort of the point of the slide here. Uh, and when you represent it, uh, in order to save you from trouble, uh, pick a format that in a data format that includes the schema in one way or another. This is implicit in JSON, where you have all of the names, but no, it's not implicit, for example, in uh, formats like Protobuf. Uh, so Avro is getting popular here, and if you use uh, uh, the Kafka platform, there's also a schema register that you will help you figure out which schema applies to this particular data and so forth. Uh, and I'm just highlighting the, the, these issues here so that you uh, can plan. And you need to plan how to, evolu how to do evolution of these schemas. When you redeploy new code that will emit new type of data, how do you handle that? Do you control the order of deployment? Do you write to new topics or so forth? And if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, remember this slide. The, you can get very, very far by cheating. There are a number of very good algorithms out there where you sacrifice a little bit of accuracy and you gain several orders of magnitude and resource requirements. And there are, there are algorithms for like basic data structures, such as counting unique items, uh, keeping maps of, uh, of how many of each item have been sold and so forth, and, and doing percentiles. And by combining these, you can, you can even build a mach sophisticated machine learning system with approximate uh, algorithms. And these can save you lots and lots of troubles. And you may very well only need like a laptop when you thought you need a big cluster to handle your data. 
So that's it. I should give credits to Avin Lecklug of Shipstead Media Group. Uh, this is presentation is joint work with him. Uh, there's a longer version on the uh, and video on the web. 